of so many here with us to come together to worship and to praise God together in spirit and in truth. Our lesson this evening is a continuation of our series on the Lord is my shepherd. We're in the third of four lessons concerning the Lord is my shepherd. If you remember in our first lesson, we looked at the protection or in the presence of the shepherd and the protection the shepherd provides. In our second lesson, we looked at the provisions and the blessings that the shepherd provides. And tonight, we will look at the promise, or his promise, that is the promise of the shepherd. In Psalm 23, look at verse 1 and verse 6. The Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Bible contains many promises, many guarantees to those who are faithful servants of God, those who put their trust and have an obedient faith in the Lord. And today we'll look at some of those promises and, take, and be encouraged to take advantage of the promises that God has made to those who are faithful. In our text, looking at verse 6 of Psalm 23, the Bible says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. When you look at the phrase, surely goodness and mercy, the first word tells us, the word surely tells us, that there is no question concerning these things. When he says, when he uses the word surely, it tells us that what would follow David and all the other faithful followers of God is a guarantee. That is, if so long as we are faithful to God, we may go through hardships and difficulties and persecutions, but no doubt goodness and mercy will follow those who are faithful to God. It's not up for the base you see there in verse 6. It doesn't say maybe or perhaps or if we, luck, or if we are lucky. He says surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What is goodness? Turn with me, Will, to Psalm 31. Psalm 31. Goodness what God, is what God provides for those who love Him. That is, things that God provides for those who love Him is good. Would God bring anything upon His followers of God, Him or His followers, simply because He wants to? Would He bring any difficulty upon them purposely just to try to taunt them because He simply can you know, the book of Job, sometimes people want to say that it is God who brings those things upon Job. But if we look at the book of Job carefully, we realize that God allowed those things to happen to him, but he wasn't the one who actually brought those things upon him. In reality, God was the one who was carrying Job through those difficulties. It wasn't him who brought those things upon Job, but he, it was him who was carrying Job through those difficulties. <laughs> look, look at Psalm 31, look at verse 19. Here the Bible says, Oh, how great is your goodness, which ye have laid up for those, now notice, who fear you, which ye have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. Now it's interesting that Christ mentions this as well when he talks about the hypocrites who are behaving like followers of God among those who are also followers of God, but who when the pleasures of the world, the men of the world come around, they begin to change their tune. He you knows what David, what the writer says there in Psalm 31, verse 19. He says, How great is your goodness, which you have laid for those who fear you. Then begins to describe those who fear him, who fear God, which you have prepared for those who now must trust in you in the presence of the sons of men, meaning in the presence of the world. Around, when we're surrounded by those of the world who despise and reject God even exists, we still trust in God in their presence. That means in the workplace, when we're surrounded by those who doubt that God even exists, who question there is to know about the church and the Bible, we still in their presence have a trust and have our hope in God. And because we do those things, you see in verse 19, he says, How great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, who keep their trust in you in the midst of the sons of men, in the midst of the world. How easy is it to be a good, faithful servant of God on the Lord's day? Well, it's easy, isn't it? 
And just surrounded by those who love the Lord and feel the same way we do. But how does that, how do we live our life the very next day when we go to work? Or we're around our neighbors? That's the idea here. It's not just for those who love the Lord when it's easy. But it's also for those who love the Lord when it's not easy, when it's difficult. In, in the presence of the sons of men. So goodness is the first thing to follow the faithful servants of God. Goodness, that is, blessings, good hiding coming from God. Does that mean we're never going to have hard times in our life? Well, of course not. But God's goodness, as we'll see in a moment, also His mercy allows us to get through those difficult times. Look again now at verse 6 of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy... He doesn't say or. He doesn't say one or the other. He says both. Surely goodness and mercy. Now as you saw with the first word, it's a guarantee only to those who are faithful, obedient servants of God that the goodness and mercy of God will follow them. Now what is mercy? Now we can look at different ideas concerning mercy in different uh, ways to describe it. But very simply, it's compassion. And pity on those who are in a situation or in a life that cannot do much for themselves. If you think about a human being and the amount of things that we have no control over. And the amount of things that God can do for us that we can no way do it to do ourselves. When our loved one is laid up in the hospital and has just perhaps with a heart attack or a stroke, what can we do physically to help them become whole again? Very little. The body is so complex, we realize very quickly there's very little we can do. We can try things, we can do procedures, we can minister medications and things to try to help ease the pain. But in reality, who is the one who decides we're going to live or not? Well, it's God. Well, who is the one who allows us to get through those situations by doing so and what does He do or show to us? His mercy. Now, let's think about that in a spiritual sense. Is there anything we can do? ourselves without God to, have, to make ourselves acceptable inside of God so we can get into the pearly gates, into eternal life. Can we get into the heavenly abode without the Son of God? No. So how has God shown His mercy toward us? By, by bringing His Son to the earth and allowing Him to die on the cross for the sins of all mankind. Is that not mercy? Because we can't do that. There's nothing we can do to have our sins wiped away. But it is God who sent that gift, His Son, to die on the cross for us. Thus we see His mercy. Look at Matthew chapter 1. And it's interesting to me that we talk about Christ. That even you can't even get out of the time period of Him being a child or infant or before He even is born. Before you realize just how important Christ is. Look at Matthew 1, verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she will bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. Now notice, for he will save his people from their sins. Now you notice in verse 21, she will bring forth. The prophecy isn't even there yet. We're already learning what he's going to do for us. Can anyone else save us from our sins? Can anyone else Allow our call our sins to be wiped away? No. As you see in verse 21, it is who? It is the Son of God who comes before man to save us from our sins. Is that not mercy? Is that not the love of God? Is that not goodness as well? You can't be good, and, or you cannot be bad at the same time sending your Son down the cross for all mankind. It's goodness and mercy that caused Him to send His Son to die on the cross. For all mankind. Turn with me, Will, to Psalm 86. <coughs> Psalm 86. Even while great, facing great difficulties in our lives, we still see the goodness of God and His mercy. When do we see the love and the power of God the most? When things aren't going so well. Look at me at Psalm 86 and then verse 12. The Bible says, I will praise you, O, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and glorify your name forever. For great is your mercy toward me, for you, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Now Sheol actually is a, the Hebrew word for 
damnation, hell itself. Not torments, but actual hell fire. Now that's how he describes his hardships. Now that's not, that's not a, just a light word to just kind of graze over, is it? He compares his present difficulties to hell itself. But look what he says in verse 13. For great is your mercy toward me, you have delivered my soul from the death of Sheol. It is God who delivered him out of that hardship that he compares to eternal damnation. So surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Turn with me, Will, to the book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations. God's gift of the faithful are continual and not a one-time blessing. You think about the love of God. And if His love, His mercy was a one-time gift, what would happen if we sin after we were baptized and continue to go into, into, and continue to sin? Well, if it's a one-time deal, one-time blessing, one-time removal of our sin, we'd be in bad shape, wouldn't we? But it's not a one-time forgiveness, is it? Looking at Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, we say the blessings of God continue to remain with those who love the Lord. Lamentations 3, looking at verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's mercy is there every day. In order to receive the mercy of God, of course, what must we do? We must repent when we fall short and do things contrary to God's will and His Word. But look at verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. If it wasn't for the mercies of God, how is a person consumed? They're consumed in sin, and they're cast, as the Bible tells us, as Christ Himself speaks of, in the gospel accounts, into a place called eternal damnation. But through the mercies, we, through His mercies, we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. When God shows mercy upon us, and when we, when we repent of our sins, we are relieved, and we have our sins again removed or redeemed from us. When we have our slate, as, a, as sometimes we say, why clean again when we truly repent? When we look at verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God never leaves the faithful. But isn't it true, God, that the faithful leave God? The Bible tells us in Isaiah 59, verse 2, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Does it say that God moves? No, it says your iniquities are what separate you from your God. God has never moved. It's we to move away from God. And what pushes us away from God are our sins, are our iniquities. But as the Bible tells us here in verse 23, the Lord's mercies, His compassions, are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. The goodness and mercy that comes from God lasts while we are faithful to Him during the time we have on this earth. The time we spend here is not always a time that is easy, is it? Me, and that, all reality, the time we spend on the earth is filled with a lot of hardships. And a lot of things can cause us to stumble and fall away from God. <clears throat> Turn with me well to Psalm 34. <clears throat> if we are to enjoy the goodness and mercy of God, we must be faithful because those who are unfaithful do not have the benefits from God. As we just saw, as we've been seeing already, who has the benefits of God's goodness and mercy? Those who love Him. Look at me at Psalm 34, looking at verse 15 through verse 19. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. 
What does that tell us? That God takes care of those who are faithful. That He makes sure those who are faithful can always come to Him and find a way to get through anything that comes their way. Look with me at verse 19. He says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We face hardships and afflictions each and every day. And for some of us who are still in the workplace, the afflictions, the hardships we face can make the day very long, can't it? Our family members who are not members of the church, who are not faithful as they should be, can make things very difficult. It's another affliction. And friends can do the same thing. But what does the Bible tell us in verse 19? The Lord delivers him out of them all. I mean, these afflictions only last for a time, because they will come to an end. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You look at the phrase, I will dwell. As a result of being faithful, we have goodness and mercy given to us from God. And as a result of those things, we, that is the faithful, will dwell with Him. And when He says there in verse, 20, in verse 6 of Psalm 23, He says, And I will dwell... He said, because God's goodness and mercy follows him, because they follow him as a result of his faithfulness, what will happen? I will dwell, as he says, in the house of the Lord forever. To dwell with him doesn't mean just to hear or be able to speak to God, or be able to be in, be in his presence. It means to literally live with him. Our home is in with God. The Father of the faithful. Turn if you will to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Sometimes if we are not careful, we forget what it really means to live with God. To live with the Father of goodness and mercy and love and wisdom. And Romans 6 and verse 8 tells us, now, if we had died with Christ, as we died with Christ because we are faithful to Him, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Now, where does Christ live today? The Bible tells us He's there with God, isn't it? And where are the faithful? The faithful will one day also be there with God as well. Turn with me to will now to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. In looking at verse 11, here the Bible tells us, This is a faithful saying, for if we die with Him, we shall also live with Him. To die with Christ means what? It means we have died with Christ because we have died in this world and we live in Christ. When we live in Christ, live a life of faithfulness, and thus we die with Him. And we shall also live with Him, the Bible says in verse 11. He says, I will dwell. We could also put our names in there and place the word I and put our own names in there. It makes a lot of difference, doesn't it? And Russell will dwell. And Glenn will dwell. Put our names in there, what happens? It applies to us because it does apply to us. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God has made sure <coughs> that the faithful... You are in eternal life and buy in the place that is proper and fitting for those who love Him. Look with me at John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, we notice what Christ says and what Christ does not say. In John 14, the Bible does not tell us that a faith will live in a dumpster, will live on the street. No, the Bible tells us in John 14, verse 2 and 3, Christ says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where are the faithful dwelling? With God. In a place so beautiful that Christ uses the words, mansion and house because it's a place where we are going to live or abide for all eternity. A place that is fit for those who are faithful to God. 
Not only are we the, with the Father, and the Father is with us, but we are in this place of rest for all eternity. If you think about the phrase eternity, it means it doesn't have a place to begin, but it also doesn't have a place to end. If you think about this slide, you think about how old we are today, how fast that seemed to change, how fast it seemed the years just fly by. And what happens, you realize that our time is running out. You know, with Christ, and body with God, and eternal, and eternal life, as time goes on, we have no less time with God. It continues on because it's for all eternity. The time we have with God does not lie down. It just keeps going and going. It has no end. Man does not have to die twice. You think about the promises of God, the promises of Christ. Christ tells us through his teachings that man doesn't have to die twice. And that's the promise he makes because he doesn't say anything otherwise. In Matthew chapter 7, looking at verse 13 and 14, he tells us that the second death is avoidable. He tells us how. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many going by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. How do we avoid facing the second death? We go through that narrow gate gaze of faithfulness. And we stay on that path. I want you to think for just a moment. The faithful will die unless Christ comes back. The only way we won't face the death according to every man on this earth is if Christ comes back before we die. But if the faithful do die on this earth before Christ comes back, do the faithful see that no, they're not. The Bible tells us they go on to paradise. He goes on to a place described as eternal life. We continue to live for eternity. Revelation 2, verse 11 tells us we live eternally, for eternal, eternally in a place of those who are faithful to God. And I want you to think also for a moment, the unfaithful, when they die, what do they face? Do they stay dead? No, they do not. The Bible tells us the dead do not stay in the grave. The Bible tells us that the dead go to a place known as torment. We learned that from the parable of the rich man Lazarus. Where does the rich man go? The place of torment. He talks about how he is tormented in the flame and how it does not go out. The unfaithful continue to feel the pain of death for all eternity. In a place designed for the unfaithful, rebellious, and thus they face the second death, or we could say eternal death. Because that's what the second death is, isn't it? You're feeling pains worthy of death and a place worthy of death, but yet you never die. That's why it's referred to the second death. Look with me at Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation 21, looking at verse 8. Here the Bible tells us for the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, adulterers, and all liars shall have their part in a lake which burned with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. A place that has no wind either. So we all have eternal life in reality, but the question is, where do we want to spend that life that lasts for all eternity? Do you want to spend in a place that's referred to as eternal life because you actually continue to live and be in a place that is pleasant? We're going to live our, our eternity out in a place known as the second death. Only you never die. All will live after their bodies stop working. But it's, it's where we live that makes the difference. And it's how we live before God today that determines which place we will live. The end result of, of our faithfulness is found in eternal life with the Father, where we abide forever because of His mercy, and it's where we see the ultimate display of God's goodness, care, and love. The promise found in Psalm 23 still extends to us today. It will extend until, the, until Christ returns. In Psalm 23, the Bible tells us, in verse 6, 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do we want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Do we want to dwell in a place where God, Christ, and all the faithful abide? The Bible tells us, Joshua reminds us in Joshua chapter 24, In Joshua 24, looking with me at verse 15, the Bible tells us here, Joshua speaking, he says, If it seems evil to, to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether God which your father served on the other side of the river, or the God the Amorites is letting you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Where was Joshua and all those who were choosing to serve the Lord? Where were they going to live? Their life came to an end. They are going to live in a place that's referred to as paradise. Because they are serving the Lord. So the question they've asked themselves today, are we going to take advantage of the promise that God has made? They made a promise today of there in Psalm 23, and the promise extends to us as well. If we are faithful servants of God, we can dwell with God and the faithful for all eternity. This evening, we have a chance to change if we have things we need to correct in our lives. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you'll repent of your sins, confess 